Okay, a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-la'in al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thumma salatu wa salamu ala khatim al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala. Wa la'anatullahi ala a'adaihim wa munkari fadailihim. Min al-an ila qiyam yawm al-deen. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to uh, to this new course that's being offered at uh, Al Hujja Seminary which is titled uh, Jurisprudential Maxims uh, I assume that uh, you guys have read the uh, the course description just uh, a couple of things I want to cover before we begin uh, the lesson. So this, uh, this text, uh, uh, Introduction to Jurisprudential Maxims uh, by Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Baqir Rawani, which is translated by Zayd uh, As-Salami, is uh, from what I've seen is, uh, is not an exact translation of uh, Sheikh Baqir Rawani's uh, book, Al-Qawa'id Al-Fiqiyya. It seems to be more of, a, uh, of an abridged version. Even in the introduction, I noticed that the translator just dis, uh, didn't uh, translate certain sections. So I recommend that you guys purchase this, that you, get, that you get a copy of this book, because I think it is helpful. But I will be personally following uh, the, uh, the Arabic text. I even noticed that the arrangement of the maxims in the English uh, translation differs from the arrangement in the, uh, in the Arabic text. So if you can uh, get a copy of this, uh, this, uh, this book, it's recommended. Even if you don't purchase the, uh, the book, inshallah, you'll find uh, that the lecture notes that I'll be providing uh, should be uh, pretty, uh, pretty thorough. Uh, you know, and that's one thing that, uh, that I do. Uh, I'll be providing you guys with, uh, with the detailed uh, lecture notes, the, PowerPoint, the PDF uh, uh, form of the PowerPoint slides. So, uh, so you guys really won't need the, uh, the book, but it's, all, it's good to have it just to kind of uh, be able to reference uh, some of the things that I'm discussing. So uh, each uh, lecture that I'll be giving will run for really approximately 45 to 50 minutes, give or take, really depending on the jurisprudential maxim that we're covering. So at the end of the, uh, the lesson, I'll, uh, I'll open up the, uh, the chat room and you guys can uh, basically type, uh, type in your questions. And if you want to remain anonymous, there is an anonymous option. So uh, we'll leave uh, questions and answers until the end. And uh, just please uh, restrict your questions to, uh, to the discussion. You know, if you have a question, make sure the question is related to, uh, to the, uh, the lecture. So uh, inshallah, with that said, uh, we'll just begin with uh, the following dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma akhrijna min bulumat al-wahm wa akrimna bi nur al-fahm. Allahumma iftah alayna abwaab rahmatik wa anshur alayna khazain ulumik bi rahmatika ya arham ar-Rahimin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One one recommendation that I would give is that you know, inshallah, with every uh, session, we'll begin with a dua because we have to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to open up our hearts and our minds and give us the ability to kind of internalize this knowledge. And secondly, if you can make an effort to attend this class and all of your, your Hausa classes in a state of wudu, because you know we're not pursuing knowledge just for the sake of getting degrees or getting jobs. We are pursuing knowledge for the sake of attaining nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your attendance in these classes, you need to see it as a, uh, a type of worship, a type of ibadah, and the best way to engage in ibadah is to be in a state of tahara. So try to be on wudu as much as you can when you attend uh, these uh, these lessons. Jazakumullah. So, uh, so let's begin. So again, the title of this course is uh, Jurisprudential Maxims. In Arabic, uh, it's called Al-Qawa'id Al-Fiqhiyya. And as the author, as Sheikh Baqir al-Irawani mentions in the, uh, the introduction of his book, he says it would not be an exaggeration to say that studying jurisprudential maxims, al-qawa'id al-fiqhiyya, is of no less 
importance than studying jurisprudential principles, al qawaid al usulia Now, why is it, why are they both important? Because a faqih, a jurist, needs both of them. You need both of them when you are deriving Islamic rulings from the primary sources. You know, if you look at the risala amaliya of your marja, there are many rulings, many fatawa, many <clears throat> religious verdicts that are issued on the basis of jurisprudential principles, al qawaid al usuliya, which really serves as the methodology for deriving Islamic law. Let me just check. Uh, I th Can you guys still hear me? For some reason, it booted me off for a second. Okay, I'm back. Okay, great. So, as I was saying, if you look at the uh, the risala amalia of uh, of your marja, there are many rulings that are based on jurisprudential principles, al qawaid al usuliya which serves as the methodology that they employ to derive Islamic uh, laws. Similarly, you'll find that there are a lot of religious rulings, there are a lot of masail, there are a lot of fatawa, there are a lot of uh, religious verdicts in the risala amaliyah that are based on jurisprudential maxims. So, a jurist uses both jurisprudential maxims, qawaid fiqhiyya, as well as qawaid usuliyya, jurisprudential principles, to determine one's legal duty before God. So you need both of these tools to derive uh, Islamic laws from the primary sources. So qawaid al fiqhiyya is, you know, these are max, jurisprudential maxims are needed in the process of ijtihad, in the same way that jurisprudential principles are needed in, uh, in the process of ijtihad, in the process of deriving uh, Islamic laws. Now, I'll give you an example of how, how useful one jurisprudential maxim can be. So, in the same way you, you have one jurisprudential principle, you have a qa'id al-usuliyya that can help you derive many different Islamic laws, Similarly, one jurisprudential maxim can provide numerous fiqhi rulings. So for example, um, as you can see on the screen, there are three questions. And these are questions that any mukallaf can ask their uh, mujtahid. For example, what does a person do if they offer their prayers and they forget to recite Surah Al-Fatiha? Say, for example, you pray Salat Al-Dhuhr, you finish and you realize that you didn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha. What do you do? Do you have to repeat the prayer? What is the course of action that you have to take? Number two, if someone offers their prayers and later realizes that they, do not, that they did not perform wudu, do they need to repeat their prayer? A third question that someone can ask, what is the ruling? regarding someone who prays in jama'a behind an imam who was performing anafila. So you're praying behind an imam. You were under the assumption that the imam was offering an obligatory prayer. You thought they were performing salat al-dhuhr, but they were performing nafila al-dhuhr. And you find that out later on. Do you have to repeat the prayer? Or you're praying behind someone in jama'ah and then you, you find out later on that they were fasid, they were sinful, they weren't righteous. Because one of the conditions of the imam of jama'ah is, is uh, he has to be adil. So these are three questions. Now, how does a faqih answer these three questions? The answer to all three questions is based on one single jurisprudential maxim known as 
Qa'idat la tu'ad, which is translated as the maxim of not repeating. And inshallah, that will be the first, uh, the first qa'idah, the first jurisprudential maxim that we'll be covering. And we'll cover that inshallah next week. So a jurist is able to derive rulings for each of these situations, each of those three questions, based on one jurisprudential maxim called the maxim of not repeating. Qa'idat la tu'ad. Now what does this maxim say? This jurisprudential maxim states that a prayer that does not need that, that a prayer does not need to be repeated except due to five things: purity, lahur, time, waqt, qibla, ruku', and sujood. So this particular maxim indicates that whenever any of these five conditions is breached, if there's a problem with any of these five, then it becomes obligatory to repeat the prayer. And it will not be obligatory to repeat the prayer if there's any type of other breach. So, so for example, the, uh, the person that, that forgot to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So for example, you pray Salat Al-Dhuhr. And then after you finish your prayer, you realize that, oh my God, I forgot to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Based on this qa'idah, based on this jurisprudential maxim, you don't have to repeat the prayer. Your prayer is valid. If we go to the second question, the second question was what? Okay. I'm back again. I don't know what is happening today. You know, I teach using Zoom all the time. It's the first time that keeps on kicking me off. In any case, uh, so if we go to the, uh, the second uh, question, that if you perform Salat al-Dhuhr as an example, and after the prayer, you realize that you didn't perform wudu, in this case, you would have to repeat the prayer. Why? What's, what's the basis for that ruling? The basis is this qa'idah. Because there was a breach when it came to the condition of tahara, tahur. So that's, uh, that's the second question. The third is if you pray behind someone in jama'ah, thinking that they're offering an obligatory prayer, and then later on you realize that they were offering a nafila prayer, a recommended prayer or you realize that the imam was not adil, do you have to repeat the prayer? You don't. Why don't you? Because of this jurisprudential maxim, because there was no breach in uh, any of these five conditions. So you see that just from this one single jurisprudential maxim, a scholar can give an answer to a number of uh, fiqhi questions related to prayer. So you see that uh, al qawaid al fiqhiyya becomes very useful in the process of uh, deriving uh, Islamic laws. Now, a little bit about um, the history of studying jurisprudential maxims. Now, in the introduction of the book, it mentions that throughout history, scholars have generally given more attention to uh, to the uh, the uh, the discipline of usul al fiqh, so they've given more attention to the science of the principles of of, uh, of jurisprudence more so than al qawaid al fiqhiyya, and which is why today you find that uh, uh, usul al fiqh has become highly developed. It's become a very intricate and vast Islamic science. So because scholars have given so much attention to usul al-fiqh, to uh, principles of jurisprudence, you find that it's become so developed that if you go to the Islamic seminaries in, in Qom, Najaf, or elsewhere, and you attend uh, Dars Kharij, which is the highest level of, uh, of, of studying in the, in the Hawza, you'll find that it would take you, on average, 
it would take you about eight to 10 years to just finish one cycle of, uh, of usul al-fiqh. Because scholars have focused so much attention on refining the theories that are discussed in usul al-fiqh, you find that it's become a very, very well-developed and uh, an intricate science. Al-Qawa'id al-Fiqiyah, unfortunately, it hasn't received as much attention. You know, in the past, scholars, our ulama, they would study Al-Qawa'id al-Fiqiyah as a subtopic in Usul al-Fiqh or at other times it would be part of the discussions in, in Fiqh. So it would be studied as a subtopic in Usul al-Fiqh and it would also be discussed in the science of in ilm al-fiqh. So <clears throat> when you look at the history of uh, the disciplines that were studied by our scholars, really up until recently, jurisprudential maxims were not seen as an independent discipline. You know, ilm al-fiqh is an independent discipline. Usul al-fiqh is an independent discipline. And qawa'id al-fiqiyya were really studied, you know, parenthetically in these sciences, or it was a very brief subtopic. <clears throat> Just to give you an example of how scholars used to bring up uh, the topic of jurisprudential maxims, and you see that it wasn't really a central topic. It was almost mentioned as a digression. So for example, <clears throat> Shaykh al-Ansari, Shaykh al-Ansari, uh, who died in uh, 1281 after the Hijrah, 1864, uh, if you go by the Common Era, <clears throat> Shaykh al-Ansari has written many, many books, but arguably the two most important works that he has produced, which are still up until this day, they are, they are considered, uh, you know, uh, important, uh, in fact, necessary uh, text to study in the Hawza. He wrote a book called Al-Makasib, which is a book on transactions. It's a book uh, where he speaks uh, in depth on uh, Islamic commercial law. And then he wrote a book called Fara'idul Usul, which is a book on the principles of jurisprudence. And in his book, uh, Fara'idul Usul, which is also called al rasail where he discusses uh, procedural uh, uh, rulings and other topics, when he discusses the procedural ruling of al-bara'ah, and, uh, and this is why I, I asked uh, students if you, uh, if you guys have studied usul al-fiqh, presumably you have, and if you studied uh, usul al-fiqh, you know that uh, when a scholar is trying to issue a verdict, verdict about a specific issue, and if there, if there, is, no, if there is no mention of this issue in, uh, in our sources, there is no explicit or implicit delil. You know, they don't have a hadith or a verse in the Quran to go off of. They, they go to, uh, they turn to uh, al-usul al-amaliyya, which is procedural rulings. And he, he speaks about the uh, asalat al baraa which is the, the principle of exoneration. And that is that if we don't have a hadith or a verse, that addresses a topic, you know, for example, in the past, you know, people used to ask ulama, is it halal for us to smoke? Now, we don't have any ahadith about smoking. There's no verse that explicitly or implicitly mentions uh, smoking. So some scholars would apply the principle of bara'a, which is the principle of exoneration. And that is to say that there is no duty Unless, you know, it's, it's not haram. Everything is halal unless we have proof that it's haram. And everything can be abandoned unless we have evidence that it is wajib. So he mentions the procedural ruling of al-bara'a. And he mentions the view of another, another prominent scholar by the name of al-Fadhul al-Tuni who contested that this procedural ruling, asalatul bara'a, can only be applied if it does not result in harm. So you cannot apply the principle of 
exoneration. You know, you can't say that there is no taklif because of the, the, uh, the uh, procedural ruling of bara'a. You can't apply it if, it's, if, not, if not acting if is going to result in harm. So, therefore, the jurisprudential maxim of qa'idat la zarar takes precedence over asaratul bara'an. In any case, the point that I want to make here, don't get too confused about bara and the point that I want to make is that in Shaykh al Ansari's discussion on bara'a, when he mentions the view of Fadl Tuni, he mentions qa'idat la zarar. Then Shaykh al Ansari begins expounding on the meaning of this jurisprudential maxim. So in his book, Al Rasail or Fara'idul Usul, he's speaking about a, a, a procedural principle which is related to Usul al Fiqh. And parenthetically, as a digression, he speaks about Qa'idat la Varar. So you see, again, here's an example of how Al Qawa'idul Fiqhiyya were discussed in the middle of usuli discussions. So it was not really treated as an independent uh, discipline. It was, it was spoken of as a digression. You know, Sheikh Al-Ansari might go off on a tangent or he'll, he'll mention a, a jurisprudential maxim parenthetically in the middle of his, uh, his discussion on uh, Asalatul Bara, for example. Now, it is believed that the first Shia scholar to produce an independent work on jurisprudential maxims was the first martyr, you know, a Shahid al Awwal, who was a, a prolific uh, Lebanese scholar from, uh, from Jabal Amin, who died in 786 after the Hijra, 1384 uh, Common Era. And the book that he wrote was Al Qawa'id Wal Fawa'id, which means the maxims and benefits. Now, this book doesn't only compile and speak about jurisprudential maxims. In, in this book, Shahid al Awwal also has discussions about uh, grammar, he references literature, he speaks about theology, he speaks about usul al fiqh. So it's not a book that's comprehensive and it's not a book that is fully dedicated to uh to jurisprudential maxims but it's it's seen it's really seen as the first uh work that focuses heavily at least on the topic of uh, of jurisprudential maxims but no one can deny that he also mentions other uh other uh sciences and other disciplines in uh, in that book and by the way, uh, Shahid al Awad, he also you know, wrote the famous uh, Al Lum'a al which, uh, which is an important uh, fiqhi text that is studied uh, in the Hawza. So he's a, he's a very prominent scholar in our, uh, in our early history. Now, after him, there's another scholar, and, and brothers and sisters, I really believe that it's important for us to at least be familiar with the names of these ulama. You know, I, I think it's very sad that, especially among the Shia, that they're unfamiliar with a lot of these great scholars who, uh, who, who are, you know, if it wasn't for them, we would be bankrupt. We would have nothing if it wasn't for the efforts of these ulama. You know, it's sad that your average Sunni knows Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi, but your average Shia, Shi'i, doesn't know who Kulaini is, doesn't know who Saduq is, doesn't know who Tusi is, or Shaykh al Ansari, or Shahid al Awal. It's important for us to know uh, our, uh, our scholarly heritage, to give homage and to, to pray and to make dua for all of these ulama who, ha who had to endure <clears throat> great hardship, they had to endure persecution, <clears throat> and in many cases they were put to death <clears throat> because of their. Uh, their efforts. So, uh, so it's important for us to gain some familiarity with, uh, with these great scholars. Now, after Shahid al Awwal, <clears throat> we have uh, Sheikh Ahmed al Naraqi. Now, the name al Naraqi, you know, you guys are Hausa students, and Naraqi should be a familiar name and because his father, 
Sheikh Ahmed al Muraqi, his father was the author of Jami uh, Saadat. Jami Saadat, the collection of felicities, which is a book on, uh, on akhlaq, a three volume book written on akhlaq. So that's his, fa- his father. The son was also an alim, and he wrote Awa'id al Ayyam, where he covered approximately 10 jurisprudential maxims. So you see, scholars are starting to focus more with the passing of time on, uh, on jurisprudential maxims. Now, again, the book, the aim of the book was not to just discuss jurisprudential maxims. The book, Awa'idul Ayyam, was more focused on exploring the concept of wilayatul faqih. You know, again, and this is another misunderstanding among many laymans, and that is that Imam Khomeini was the fir- he was the the architect, or he was the first one to discuss you know wilayatul faqih. Scholars have written extensively on the topic of wilayatul faqih even before him, and an example is Sheikh Ahmed al Naraqi. So in his book, he focus he explores the concept of wilayatul faqih and the authenticity of other hadith references, and thus. His book, Awa'idul Ayyam, is really not a book that is completely focused on jurisprudential maxims. He discusses 10 jurisprudential maxims in the light, you know, through the lens of, uh, of, uh, of looking at the, uh, the scope of Wilayatul uh, Faqih. Another scholar <clears throat> later on, who, is, who you can consider a contemporary scholar, is Sheikh Agha Buzurg al Tahrani, who died in uh, 1389 after the Hijra. He passed away in 1970. And he produced a very, very valuable work, which is really an indispensable book to any faqih, any scholar. And that is uh, and he, Sheikh Agha Buzurg al Tahrani was a prominent jurist, he was a faqih, but he's known. Uh, as really a bibliographer because he wrote a book called Al-Dhari'a Ila Tasanif al-Shiha which is essentially, uh, essentially an encyclopedia I believe it's about 20-25 volumes and it's an encyclopedia in alphabetical order I believe where he collects all of the works and the books of that, that he was able to of Shia scholars generation after generation going back to the times of uh, the uh, the imams. So you find that, uh, and the reason why he wrote this book is because Sunni scholars used to, you know, criticize the Shia for not having fuqaha in the early history of Islam, and they used to kind of ridicule the fact that you know you Shias you don't have you don't have books you haven't produced your scholars haven't produced works that can compare. To the uh, to the number of books and the uh, the scholarly writings of Sunni scholars, so he wrote this bibliography or this encyclopedic text which collects all of the books and all of the writings and texts of uh, of Shia ulama throughout history. And in his book Al Dariya, he mentions manuscripts written on the topic of Qawaid Fiqhia on the topic of jurisprudential maxims by Sayyid Mahdi al-Qizwini and Sheikh Muhammad Ja'far al-Istirabadi. So you find that Sheikh Agha Buzurg al-Tahrani, he mentions that we do have scholars who have written on the topic of jurisprudential maxims. Now, albeit it's not nearly to the extent that uh, scholars wrote on usul al-fiqh, but nonetheless, there were efforts by scholars to write, uh, to write uh, independent works, or to at least write uh, essays on uh, on the topic of al qawaid al fiqhia Now, <clears throat> in recent times, scholars have made a more concerted effort to compile all of the jurisprudential maxims into a single work. So, for example, a Sayyid al al Bujnurdi who died in 1395 age, who died in 1975, he wrote Al-Qawa'id al-Fiqhiyya, and he tried to gather all of the jurisprudential maxims, as many as he could. 
uh, Sheikh uh, Nasim Makarim al-Shirazi, who's one of the maraja in Qom, who's alive today. He wrote uh, Al-Qawa'id al-Fiqiyya. Sayyid al-Mustafawi, who's also alive today, he wrote uh, Mi'at Qa'id al-Fiqiyya, 100 jurisprudential maxims. And incidentally, this was the, uh, the book that I actually studied when I was, uh, when I was in Najaf, in addition to Sheikh Baqar al-Irawani's book, which we are studying. So you find that uh, Sheikh uh, Sayyid al-Mustafa, we was able to derive 100 jurisprudential maxims from the, the various ahadith that he, was, uh, that he looked at. So sometimes, and you'll see that most of our ahadith, most of our jurisprudential maxims are, are derived from, from narrations, from ahadith that have been transmitted to us uh, from the, uh, the Ahlul Bayt. Now, what is the difference between a jurisprudential maxim and a jurisprudential principle? Now, I've mentioned al-qawa'id al-fiqhiyya and al-qawa'id al-usuliyya. What's the difference between a qa'id al-fiqhiyya, a jurisprudential maxim, and a jurisprudential principle? Now, it must be noted that there is no consensus among scholars on the distinctions between the two. So you're not going to find an agreement among the ulama as to regarding what differentiates a jurisprudential maxim from a jurisprudential principle. There are different opinions. It's a debatable topic. But Sheikh al-Irawani in his book, and I, I believe you'll even find this discussion in the English translation or the abridged version of the book. Sheikh al-Irawani mentions a few distinguishing features which we'll, uh, which we'll share. Number one, so there are three main differences between a jurisprudential maxim and a jurisprudential principle that Sheikh al-Irawani mentions in his book. Number one, a jurisprudential maxim is a general religious ruling that can be used to achieve particular religious rulings. And these particular religious rulings are therefore instances of that general religious ruling. As for a jurisprudential principle, it is a general ruling that can be used to derive universal rulings which are different from the general ruling. Now, just to make it very simple, a jurisprudential maxim is a general ruling and it produces a particular religious ruling. And a jurisprudential principle is a general ruling that gives us another, uh, it gives us another general religious ruling which are different from the general rulings. Now, just to make it uh, easier for us to understand, what I, with the following example, it will become clear what we mean. You take one of the jurisprudential maxims, Qa'idatu tahara which is a maxim that we will study, the maxim of purity. Qa'idatu tahara is a, is a jurisprudential maxim that states that if you doubt whether something has become najis, has become mutanajis, you can assume that it is tahir until you have knowledge that it is that it has that it has become impure so this maxim in itself is a general religious ruling everything is tahir until you know it has become mutanajis so when you apply this general ruling it produces a ruling that correlates with the content of the ruling, albeit more specific. Now, for example, if you have clothes and you have doubt whether your clothes have become mutanajis or it's still tahir, if you apply qa'idatul tahara in this situation, you will assume that your clothes are tahir. So, Qa'idatu tahara is a general ruling, and the content of it is 
Tahara and Najasa. When you apply it, you have a specific religious ruling that is about Tahara and Najasa. You conclude that my clothes are Tahir. So the specific religious ruling matches with the content of the jurisprudential maxim. Aidat al Tahara says that everything is Tahir until you know that it is mutanajis, that it is qadr. When I apply that general ruling, I get a specific ruling, which is my, I can assume my clothes are tahir, because I don't have knowledge that it has become mutanajis. When I say that my clothes are tahir, that is a specific religious ruling. It's an instance of that general maxim. So you see that when I apply it, it mirrors the content because the Qa'idat al-Tahara, it's speaking about Najasa and Tahara. When I apply it, the specific instance is also Najasa and Tahara. I can conclude that my clothes are either Tahir or Najis. Whereas a jurisprudential principle, the Hujiyat Khabar al for example, the validity of a narration of a reliable person. Now, this is a jurisprudential principle. When I apply this jurisprudential principle, you conclude, for example, you, for example, you find a hadith and you determine that the transmitter of the hadith is reliable. It's a hujjah. It can be used as evidence, admissible in Islamic law. When you apply hujjah at khabar al-thiqa, you conclude, for example, that it is prohibited to consume grape juice that has, that has boiled until two-thirds has evaporated. So if grape juice boils, the moment it boils, it's haram for you to, to consume it. Now, this ruling does not correlate with the principle because the validity of the narration of a reliable person and the prohibition of Consumption are two different things, right? So a jurisprudential principle, when you apply it, it produces a ruling that is not related direct. It's not related. It doesn't correlate with the content of the principle. Whereas qa'idatul tahara, the maxim of purity, when you apply it, it produces a ruling that matches with the content of the maxim itself. When you apply qa'idat al-tahara, the maxim of purity, you say, okay, yes, my clothes are tahir, or my clothes are najis. So it matches. Whereas hujiyat khabur al-thiqa, when you apply it, it's going to produce a ruling that doesn't have anything to do with the narration of a reliable person. When you apply it, you, you, you're going to come to the conclusion that when you, when you boil, for example, grape juice, it will become uh, prohibited for you to consume. When you apply the uh, the narration, the validity of a narration of a reliable person, you uh, you get uh, you get rulings that that don't correlate with the content of the uh, that general ruling. I hope uh, that made sense. Number two, so that's one difference. The second difference between a jurisprudential maxim and a jurisprudential principle is that a jurisprudential maxim, when applied, gives us particular rulings, whereas jurisprudential principles give us universal rulings. So if we go back to our example, if we apply the maxim of purity, we conclude that this particular water is pure or that particular garment is pure, right? So you have a general ruling. When you apply it, you get a specific ruling. So for example, my, my dishdasha, my garment, I have doubt whether, you know, for example, I see a liquid splash on it. And I don't know, is, was that liquid Bahir or Najis? Are my, is my Dishdasha now Mutanajis? 
I don't know, I have doubt. I assume that it is Tahir, because the maxim of purity states that everything is Tahir until you know with certainty that it has become Najis or Mutanajis. So in this case, I don't know, so I can assume that it's Tahir. So the specific, the particular ruling in this case is that this Dishdasha, this garment is Tahir. So you go from general to specific. This specific garment is Tahir. Or that specific, you know, container of water is Tahir. But if, when we apply the jurisprudential principle of Hujiyat Khabar al-Thiqa, we conclude that grape juice, for example, in general, is prohibited when it boils. We're not speaking about any specific type of, we're not speaking about this particular grape juice or that particular grape juice. So jurisprudential principles, when they are applied, they give us universal rulings. Whereas when we apply jurisprudential maxims, we get particular, specific, specific rulings. Now, number three, it is the responsibility of the mukallaf, those who are religiously responsible, the common folk, the layman, and not the jurist to apply the jurisprudential maxims. So qawa'at fiqhi is a very practical uh, science for us. So qa'idat al-tahara, for example, the, the maxim of purity, you know, you're not going to go ask your merjah whether your this specific garment is mutanajis. It's up to you. It's up to the mukallaf to apply the jurisprudential maxim. So it doesn't make sense to ask your merjah that is the dress which is in my closet, is it tahir or is it mutanajis? The faqih is going to say that you have to apply the jurisprudential maxim, everything is tahir until, the, until you know that it is mutanajis. So you have to apply it. It's not the, it's not the job of, it's not the duty of the, the scholar. On the other hand, it is the responsibility of the faqih, of the jurist, to apply jurisprudential principles. So for example, with, when we spoke about hujiyatu, khabar thiqa the validity of the narration of a reliable person, that's a jurisprudential principle. Now, you, you know, a layman is not going to be able to apply that jurisprudential principle. That's the job of the faqih. So a faqih will look at a hadith, they'll look at the senate, and they'll determine that this person in the senate, they'll, you know, uh, refer to the, uh, the experts on ilm al-rijal, and they'll determine that this person, Fulan ibn Fulan, you know, Sahal ibn Ziyad, for example, they'll say, okay, Sahal ibn Ziyad is reliable. Now, if I tell you Sahal ibn Ziyad is reliable, are you going to be able to benefit from that information? No, because you're not a faqih. You're not going to be able to apply that knowledge, apply that principle. So I apply the principle of and I determined that this particular person is reliable. And therefore, the hadith that this person transmits becomes a proof. So this is something that only the faqih can apply. Whereas al-qawa'id al-faqiyya, jurisprudential uh, maxims, it's in our hands. It's in the hands of the mukallaf to uh, to apply now so that's the difference between al qawaid al fiqhiyya and al qawaid al usuliyya now what's the difference between al qawaid al fiqhiyya and al masail al fiqhiyya so you know when you when you open up the legal manual of your marja taqlid you'll find that each ruling is called mas'ala mas'ala 1 Mas'ala number two. Those are jurisprudential rulings. So what's the difference between a jurisprudential maxim and a jurisprudential ruling? Now, put very simply, 
The former, meaning a jurisprudential maxim, is more general than a, a, uh, a jurisprudential ruling, a mas'ala fiqhiyya. So for example, the maxim of purity, qa'idatul tahara, is a jurisprudential maxim. And it states, everything is pure until you know it is impure. Is that general or, or is that specific? That's general because we're saying everything. So this is a jurisprudential maxim because it's general. We're not talking about clothes or water. Everything is pure until you know it is impure. General. Now when I say wine is impure, this is a mas'ala fiqhiyya. It's a jurisprudential issue because it is specific to wine. So you see the difference between al-qa'id al-fiqhiyya and al-mas'al al-fiqhiyya is that al-mas'al al-fiqhiyya jurisprudential rulings are more specific than jurisprudential maxims. Now, what are the areas of similarity and difference? So going back to uh, jurisprudential maxims and jurisprudential principles, what they have in common is that they both have an encompassing aspect over more than one issue. So they're both general in a sense. So, you know, for example, Qa'idatul Tahara, the maxim of purity, it's not speaking about any specific in a water, any specific clothing, it's, it's, it's general. Similarly, hujjiyat khabar al the uh, the validity of a narration of a reliable person is general and it can be applied to, to many different instances. So it has this encompassing aspect. So they both have a degree of generality. Now the difference is that the jurisprudential principle is used to derive a religious ruling which is different, which is similar to the second point that I mentioned that was probably the most confusing for you. The difference is that a jurisprudential principle, al usuliyya, is used to derive a religious ruling which is different to it. But the result of applying the jurisprudential maxim is a religious ruling that, core, that relates directly to the maxim in its context. So as I said, when you apply hujjiyat khabar al-thiqa, when you apply it, the end result, the religious ruling that you are able to derive is something that is different from the content of the principle. So the validity of the, of the, uh, the narration of a reliable person, that is different from you know, the religious ruling of wine is, is impure. Those are different things. But when I apply a jurisprudential maxim, for example, قَعِدَتْ لَا تُعَادْ You know, not repeating. When you apply this, you might get a religious ruling that says you don't have to repeat your prayer if you forget to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and you realize it after you pray. You don't have to repeat. So the religious ruling is what? You don't have to repeat. So it correlates with the content of the jurisprudential maxim. So jurisprudential maxims, they produce rulings that mirror the content of the jurisprudential ruling, uh, jurisprudential maxim, whereas jurisprudential principles, al-qa'id al-usuliyya, when you apply it, it gives you a, a something, a ruling that is that is different from the content of the principle itself. Now, the number of jurisprudential maxims. Now, how many jurisprudential maxims do we have? The answer is there is no consensus among the scholars regarding the exact number of jurisprudential maxims. Sometimes one scholar might see two jurisprudential maxims as one, Others might see one jurisprudential maxim as being two separate jurisprudential maxims. So there's no agreement. You know, Sayyid al, uh, al Mustafawi, for example, argues that there are upwards of 100 jurisprudential maxims. 
So there is no agreement as to how many there are. You know, scholars will have to go through the, the hadith. Scholars, uh, contemporary scholars or, or scholars in the future might discover new jurisprudential maxims. They might understand uh, certain jurisprudential maxims from a hadith that were not understood by their predecessors. So we don't have a set number, but in this course, inshallah, we're going to be covering some of the most relevant jurisprudential maxims. Uh, I think uh, in al qawaid al fiqhia at least the Arabic uh, text, there are, I believe there are approximately 20 or 30. I would have to go back and count. But uh, what we'll cover will be the most uh, important and the most relevant uh, to our, uh, our daily lives, inshallah. Uh, so with that said, uh, that concludes uh, uh, the first session. I hope uh, it wasn't too confusing for you guys. Uh, so I'll open up the, uh, the chat uh, room for questions. If you have any questions, you can, uh, you can type them. And if you want to remain anonymous, I think there's also an option uh, to ask questions uh, anonymously. I hope I didn't lose you guys. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikhna, as far as the translation, the translated book that you showed in the beginning of the class, yeah. is something that the seminary will be providing to us as part of this course, or is that something that we need to go and get on? No. It's a recommended text. I haven't made it uh, a mandatory text. And the reason is because the lecture notes are pretty thorough. You know, I'm, I'm providing, uh, you know, uh, what, what is in the book and even more in the lecture notes. So technically you won't need the book, but if you just want to have it just as a reference, uh, I'm, I'm the type of person I, I just like to have the physical copies of books. I'm so if you want it as a reference, you're you're free to do that. But uh, you would have to get that on your own because it's not a required text. You'll have more than enough just from uh, from the uh, the lecture and the uh, the lecture notes that I'll provide. But uh, I was actually I was under the impression that this was an exact translation of the Arabic text, but it does seem to be an abridged version because I've seen entire sections that were just not even translated in the English. Uh, so, so just keep that in mind. And even the order, for example, in the English translation, the first maxim that he discusses is the uh, the maxim of purity. Whereas in the Arabic text, the first maxim that is that is discussed is the maxim of not repeating. So I'll be following the uh, the Arabic because it's a bit more thorough, and I'll I'll include uh, I'll include them in the lecture notes that you'll be receiving. Thank you, Shifa. Any uh, any other questions or comments? I hope I, I hope I didn't confuse you guys. Uh, inshallah, I'll do my best to kind of simplify the material as much as I can. If you feel that I'm mentioning terms that you're totally unfamiliar with, please uh, please let me know. And uh, because I'm not, I, I don't know if all of you guys have taken Usul al Fiqh. So in in the in the WhatsApp group or uh, here, if you guys can just indicate to me what classes you've taken, just so I have an idea uh, of, uh, of your level. So if none of you have taken Usul al Fiqh, I might, you know, kind of just spend a, a few minutes, you know, discussing some of the uh, jurisprudential principles if they're if they're brought up in the middle of the discussion. So just let me know, and I'll be happy to do that. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam. Inshallah, you're doing well. Uh, just a small request about the thing that you just mentioned. Uh, we had taken, um, my husband and myself, we had taken a solo fic, yeah. but that was like two years ago. Okay. It was in the first year of the seminary. So it would be really nice if you could just brush up on the definitions or give a small. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that, inshallah. So, uh, yeah, because, because uh, usul al fiq is... Uh, even if you study it, it's hard to remember because it's such exactly, a, yes. it's a very dry, uh, I mean, some people see it as a very dry science. So in the middle of, so if, if we're covering a jurisprudential maxim and Sheikh al-Irawani alludes to uh, a jurisprudential principle, 
I'll, I'll make a point to kind of clarify it and just refresh your memory or even just give a little brief introduction to what that jurisprudential maxim, uh, that jurisprudential principle uh, is all about, just to make it easier to follow uh, the discussion. Yes, that would be really nice. Thank you so much. Did you guys, please, I mean, I'm, I'm open to constructive criticism. If, if, if you feel that uh, it's still too difficult or I'm not doing a good job at kind of explaining some of the concepts, please let me know and I'll, I'll try to kind of... Uh, Honestly, Sheikhna, you are doing a good job. It's just that the te uh, terminology in this subject is too heavy to digest. Yeah. So that's the problem. Uh, Alhamdulillah, you're doing a great job. Jazakum Allah. So inshallah, you know, it's because this is a new topic, just bear with me, inshallah, it'll get easier. A lot of the concepts will be repeated. So you'll get used to it. You'll become more familiar with the, the terms and the concepts. And... Uh, and it, don't be don't be too discouraged if you don't understand everything, you know, from just from listening to the lecture. You might have to go back and listen to the lecture again. You might have to, you know, um, go through the notes. You know, bring bring your questions to the next session. You know, I, I imagine that you probably understand seventy to eighty percent of what I present. You know, so that thirty percent you might have to kind of go back and review ask questions and you know sometimes you got to squeeze your mind a bit you got to challenge yourself you know when we when, when we were studying in the house there were days where i would go to class and i'd be like what are we talking about and that's how you learn so that's you got to kind of uh challenge yourself and uh at the end of this course inshallah you'll walk away with uh, a deeper appreciation of really what it takes to be a scholar you know sometimes i think oftentimes we underestimate the the aptitude and uh, this, the scholarly rigor, the intellectual rigor of our ulama. So, you know, these classes are a way of kind of humbling us that, you know, you know, we need to kind of appreciate what goes behind, what goes into deriving Islamic law from its sources and how, how intricate these discussions are and how brilliant our ulama are when it comes to analyzing the hadith. Very true. Uh, Sheikh, now, um, just to, uh, like, give you a heads up we did discuss a few jurisprudence uh, prudential maxims when we were talking about islamic law okay. so like qaidatul tahara we did um qaidatul firaq we did perfect, um, perfect. we did uh, talk about the bara law of bara when we did um the legal uh, yeah. legal yeah. theory so, 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 it's, so it's good that you guys have some background yes aware of certain terminologies but then when it comes to certain other terminologies which are very hard yeah. uh, please if you don't mind just, yes uh, i'll do that i'll do that inshallah thank you so much Shekhna, yeah. yes one other quick question uh, in regards to the comment you just made about uh, jurisprudential the the topic of jurisprudence that it's hard for folks to remember even if they went through the class altogether uh, could you provide some insight in terms of, so when you were attending the houses, how was it that you guys were keeping up with this if it, the material was dry and hard to remember? Um, so when you are coming for a class like this, is it something that you remember right off, off the top of your head or is it something that you have to prepare? Because even me, even when I'm preparing this, uh, you know, these lectures, I, I still have to review, but the difference is that it's not new. I'm just refreshing as opposed to kind of learning the material, you know, from, from scratch. But the way, that, the way that we keep it fresh in our minds is uh, and that's why I encourage you guys, you know, the students who are in the WhatsApp group, if it's possible, you know, have a, have a conference call together and just do a, a review, review session. You know, that's what we used to do in the Hausa, where we, first of all, we, 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 we come to class, we listen to the lecture. Oftentimes we would read the lesson before we come to class, we listen to the lecture. After, we would do mubahatha with other students. And as we move higher in our studies, we, uh, what we would do is that we would end up teaching the courses that we've taken. So, so I've, I've taken this course, so I was very happy to have the opportunity to teach it now because it just reinforces the, uh, the information. So inshallah, once you guys finish this class, you know, maybe, you know, first year students, you know, you guys can be maybe teacher assistants or you can go back and at least teach some of the jurisprudential maxims that, uh, that you've covered. 
Thank you, Shaykhna. Ahsantum, Jazakumullah. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, so uh, I think uh, we're running over time, uh, so I'll have to, uh, to sign off. So uh, we'll, uh, I'll see you guys uh, next week, inshallah, and uh, you guys will have the, uh, the notes and the recordings, inshallah. Thank you again. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum.